Chapter 6, Avebury The northern station Stone of Stonehenge is in direct alignment between the center of the circle and Avebury. Avebury lies in an area of chalkland in the upper Kennet Valley, at the western end of the Berkshire Downs, which forms the catchment for the River Kennet and supports local springs and seasonal watercourses. The monument stands slightly above the local landscape, sitting on a low chalk ridge 160 meters, 520 feet, above sea level, to the east of the Marlborough Downs, an area of lowland hills. Archaeologists freely admit that the history of Avebury before the construction of the Henge is uncertain because little datable evidence has emerged from modern excavations. But stray finds of flints at Avebury, dated between 7000 and 4000 BC, indicate that the site was visited in the late Mesolithic period. If we now apply the same groundwater table adjustments demonstrated in our hypothesis, we are left with a landscape rendered unrecognizable by groundwater, as the Avebury Circle becomes an island. The most remarkable thing is that Avebury now looks like a sister site to Old Sarum, both are perfectly round islands surrounded by groundwater, both have two inner circles and are aligned to Stonehenge via its moated station stones. The next item of interest is the orientation of the long barrows. If you look at a map of Avebury, you can see that the barrows are not all oriented in the same direction. Archaeologists would have you believe that these monuments were only made for the dead but, if that was the case, why don't they point to a particular direction, such as the sunrise or sunset, or something equally symbolic? From our Mesolithic groundwater map, we can show that East Kennet Long Barrow was the first hill marker you would see if approaching Avebury from the eastern inlet. Although West Kennet Long Barrow is seen side on, it would still be visible as a smaller marker, as it had large white stones added to its eastern entrance to give it greater visibility. When the groundwater started to recede, as we saw at Old Sarum, our ancestors tried to keep their monument an island by adding ditches. These ditches would have been shallow at first, becoming deeper over the centuries until they were finally abandoned, leaving what we see today. This gradual process explains more clearly how and why such a task was undertaken, as the logistical requirements of building the Avebury ditches in one go would have been beyond a prehistoric civilization whose only tools were antler picks and stone axes. Current estimates suggest that it took 1.5 million working hours to build the Avebury Monument. In simple terms, that's 200 people working full-time for three to four years. This is clearly not plausible. As you will be able to imagine if you have ever visited the site or you understand the requirements of manual labor, it would take a lot more to construct such a large area with such basic tools. The nearby human-made Silbury Hill contains 248,000 cubic meters of chalk and would have taken 18 million working hours to complete. That's equivalent to 500 people working full-time for 15 years. Yet we are expected to believe that Avebury's 125,000 cubic meters of chalk took just 1.5 million working hours to move. It's more likely that these monuments grew over centuries, slowly but surely, the ditches starting at just two meters, like Stonehenge, getting deeper over hundreds of years as the moat was regularly cleaned out until they reached the final dimensions of 11 meters deep and 22 meters wide. Now everyone knows that Stonehenge, Avebury and Old Sarum were cut out of the hard chalk with antler picks. Or do we? For if the archaeologists are right, the entire site must be littered with the broken remains of these objects, but they're not. Half of Stonehenge has been fully excavated and found just 82 pieces probably from about 50 full antlers. At Avebury even less have been found. Either antlers are the most formidable natural tools in the world, or what we see are the remnants of tools used after the construction for alterations, or to clean out the ditches. Mike Parker Pearson found strange cut marks in the bottom of a ditch at Durrington in 2008. These cut marks were so thin that they could only be made by a metal blade, like a bronze or copper axe. The only problem is that according to traditional archaeology, bronze technology is not available during this period of history, unless, of course, the accepted Victorian dating periods are fundamentally wrong, 
and metals were used long ago. More recent discoveries now indicate that the peoples of Europe had bronze as early as 4600 BCE in Bulgaria, found in a gold and bronze grave. So there is no good reason to believe that the builders of Stonehenge did not have bronze or copper axes to cut the chalk, towards the end of the Mesolithic period, as they would be trading with these places in Europe using their boats. Moreover, the cross-section drawing of Avebury drawn in 1914 by St. George Grey shows that our ancestors took great care to make sure the bottom was flat, the question is why? If it's a ceremonial ditch, as some archaeologists suggest, why flat and so deep, indeed would not a small easy-to-cut V-ditch suffice and be less time-consuming? Moreover, the excavation serves us with the smoking gun of conclusive evidence we have been seeking. Because as St. George Grey's men dug, Following the ancient ditches cut deep in the soil, they had to stop working, as the workmen had hit the water table level and the ditch started to flood. Now, this is summer 1914, and they have reached the water table level. We know in winter the water table would be higher and more importantly, we shown in previous chapters that the water tables were higher in the past than today. This proves that when this ditch was originally dug, it filled with water turning it into a moat. Furthermore, the question that needs to be answered is why a flat bottom moat as you are not going to see it when it is full of water. The simple answer is the same reason that we today dredge rivers and boat canals, to remove the silting. Natural silting over time will create a round bottom to the moat. If you make the bottom flat, it will take longer to silt up than if it was round, prolonging its use or for the need to remove the silt. Is this what we are finding in the fill of these ditches, and the tools used to keep the moat clean and free from weeds, would be the antler picks and cow shoulder blades found in excavations in small quantities. Eventually, when Avebury lost all of its groundwater, our ancestors built Silbury Hill as the new landing site to the complex. Silbury Hill is the largest human-made island in Europe and was set at the end of the Neolithic waterway. Composed mainly of chalk and clay excavated from the surrounding area, the mound stands 40 meters, 130 feet high and covers about 5 acres. As we have already seen, it would have taken 18 million man-hours to deposit and shape this vast pile of chalk and earth, on top of the natural hill that forms Silbury's foundation. The base of the hill is circular, 167 meters, 548 feet in diameter. The summit is most importantly, flat-topped and 30 meters, 98 feet in diameter. Avebury Construction Sequence Phase 1 After the post-glacial flooding, water subsided and Windmill Hill became an island which was the first trading post in this area. As the waters from the flooding subsided the site had to cut ditches for boats into the side of the hill, we now call these early trading sites with round canal cuttings, causewayed enclosures. Phase 2 When the waters no longer reached the moats of Windmill Hill they looked south of the site for a new home and chose Avebury. They then dug ditches bigger than ever to take larger boats and ships with a wall to protect them from the weather and storms. Phase 3 When the water fell so far that they could not get the ships to Avebury they created a landing site on the Kennet with a stone walkway to Avebury we call Silbury Avenue which attracted ships and boats via a gigantic beacon built on a human-made hill known as Silbury Hill. Silbury Avenue In 2014 a remarkable new stone avenue was located at the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Avebury in Wiltshire. Previously, Two other stone avenues called the West Kennet and the Beckhampton are known to archaeologists as they have some of the massive sarsen stones that line these avenues still present, but this newly discovered pathway was never thought to exist. As the discoverer, I have named the pathway Silbury Avenue as it is merely the path directly to Silbury Hill over Waden Hill. The discovery was made by digital photographic pictures that show a series of green patches that measures over 470 meters in length towards the apex of the hill. 
We can therefore estimate if it ran down the far side of the hill towards Silbury Hill, it would have been approximately 1,470 meters in total length. From these measurements and by counting the discolorations of this new avenue, we can estimate that Silbury Avenue had at least 19 pairs of stones to the apex with an average of 25 meters between each pair. We can also estimate the width of this avenue at about 15 meters to 20 meters. In comparison, the West Kennet Avenue, calculated from Google Earth, has a pairing at a distance of about 22 to 24 meters, and a width of the avenue is approximately 15 meters to 17 meters, so a very close match. Excavations and restoration work carried out by Keeler and Piggott in 1936 on the West Kennet Avenue showed that this part of the avenue was built in series of ten straight sections and not the smooth serpentine shape as suggested by the 18th century antiquarian Stukeley. Where stones were missing, they placed concrete markers above the excavated stone holes where they had formerly stood, so providing a record of the northern section of the avenue. Paradoxically, Keeler's planned survey of this section of the West Kennet Avenue shows it heading away from the southern entrance of the Henge, while other pairs seem to repair this error with an awkward zigzag route to connect with the southern entrance. Recent archaeological commentary on the avenue has suggested two interpretations for this convoluted approach route. Burl claimed that this was a mistake of the prehistoric builders in starting the avenue at both ends but failing to anticipate an accurate direction for each section to join up. But Gillings and Pollard argued that Keeler's excavation plan is a mistake, and re-excavation will establish a more direct route for this section of the avenue. Yet quite rightly, Sims 2009, suggested that if it were a mistake, then it cannot explain why elsewhere in the Avebury Monument there are more complex highly accurate pre-planned features. The reality is that Burl, Gillings and Pollard are all wrong, as the discovery of my new avenue shows why such a strange zigzag shape was formed, as the original stones were aligned with Silbury Avenue from an earlier date than the West Kennet Avenue. This avenue led directly to Silbury Hill but was then abandoned for a path leading southeast around the base of the hill to the sanctuary, at a later date. Moreover, an earlier antiquarian of the 17th century, John Aubrey, recorded how the other end of the avenue connected to the western entrance of the sanctuary with the exact same dog-leg design. Showing the two ends of West Kennet Avenue were additions. The change of direction on the southern section of West Kennet Avenue shows that this avenue was used at a very late date in Avebury's history and after the sanctuary's construction. This would explain why the sanctuary was altered so many times in its past. The likelihood is that the sanctuary was the termination point of the ridgeway over an adjacent hill. Silbury Avenue doesn't go in the shortest line to Silbury Hill, but to the highest point, where we find a series of nine barrows directly to the east side of the new avenue. Archaeologists have dated these features as Bronze Age, although no excavations have ever been attempted as the barrows, or other features on top of the hill, were destroyed even before Stukeley visited the site in the 18th century. The only significant findings made in this area was in an oval-shaped pit, three feet deep, and discovered by workmen in 1913 while digging a trench for water pipes on Waden Hill. The pit, situated 105 meters northeast of the pond on the hill, contained windmill hill sherds, sarsen muller, two flint scrapers, charcoal and burnt flints, together with broken bones of sheep, pig and ox, some of them burnt. The barrows on the left of Silbury Avenue indicate that these features were built after the avenue was constructed and not because of them, as the path passes the barrows to one side without termination. Although the new avenue would have led towards Silbury Hill, it did not terminate at the monument as it was inaccessible due to it being surrounded by deep water, which can still be seen today during the winter seasons. Silbury Hill If you understand how the landscape looked and was used in the past, then such beacons can be easily found all over Britain, even ones built, to a similar design to Silbury Hill. To find this unique design we can look at the most recent re-excavation and detailed examination of Silbury Hill, by English Heritage. 
for only a few years ago it needed to be shored up because of the reckless archaeologists of the past, cutting vast tunnels and shafts into the hill, looking for tombs and treasure making it totally unstable. This is from the Daily Mail in 2010. Silbury Hill, one of the most mysterious and striking monuments in Britain, was a prehistoric cathedral, built layer by layer over 100 years, a new study suggests. The 4,000-year-old Earth Mound, which towers over the Wiltshire countryside, was the tallest human-made structure in Europe until the Middle Ages. However, despite its size, and repeated attempts to tunnel into the heart of the mound, archaeologists have long been puzzled about how and why it was created. Now a new book published by English Heritage suggests that the 120 feet high hill was not built to a grand blueprint but was assembled by at least three generations of Bronze Age Britons between 2400 and 2300 BC. A study of soil, rocks, gravel and tools inside the hill shows that it went through 15 distinct stages of development. Dr. Jim Leary, English heritage archaeologist, said that the final shape of the mound may have been unimportant. He argues that the familiar outline of stepped sides and the flat top visible today is primarily the result of Anglo-Saxons and later alterations. The flat top, especially, was often seen to be a platform deliberately built to bring people closer to the skies. But new evidence is increasing telling us that our Neolithic ancestors display an almost obsessive desire to constantly change the monument, to rearrange, tweak, and adjust it. It's as if the final form of the hill did not matter, it was the construction process that was important. This investigation showed for the first time that the hill was built like the pyramids of Egypt and South America in steps. Dr. Leary now believes the mound went through 15 stages of construction, and up to 100 different phases within four or five generations. It would make sense that a monument was a round-based hill made in layers, similar to Marlborough Mound, sometimes known as Merlin's Barrow, also excavated by Dr. Leary, hence his idea. The question not answered by archaeologists is, why build this monument in stages? Fortunately, the answer is simple to make it higher, for Silbury was a beacon to attract ships to its harbour. Over time the height of the mound was raised to increase the beacon's visibility. The flat top, especially, was often seen to be a platform deliberately built to bring people closer to the skies. Unfortunately, the article is also full of nonsense like this quotation. So, the ancestors built a hill at the bottom of a valley to get closer to the skies. Is it me? or can anyone see the error in this statement? You may therefore respond to my criticism by asking, wouldn't a beacon on top of a hill have greater visibility? Yet the reason the beacon is located in the watery harbour and not on top of a hill, is that the light shows the exact location of mooring places, in bad weather and at night, when visibility is poor. This type of device can be seen throughout our recent nautical history as seen at the Spurn Point Lighthouse. The earliest reference to a lighthouse on Spurn Point is 1427, which was a coal-fired lighthouse at the ground level. There were several lighthouses of various designs until in 1767, John Smeaton was commissioned to build a new pair of lighthouses, one a 90-feet tower. The 1895 lighthouse is a round brick tower, 128 feet tall, painted black and white. It was designed by Thomas Matthews. Its main light had a range of 17 nautical miles. Silbury Hill also started at ground level and was built up, like Spurn Point, over hundreds of years until it reached the 120 feet height seen today. The Harbour Silbury Hill was built as a beacon for Avebury within a deep natural port that now surrounds the hill which still floods in wet winters. However, they had a problem as the trading centre Avebury was just under a kilometre from this new port and therefore, a trackway was needed to be constructed to the old site. Silbury Stone Avenue was this new pathway. It goes from Silbury Hill Harbour to Avebury over Waden Hill, this trackway was lined with the same gigantic sarsen stones we now see currently in West Kennet Stone Avenue and also believed to have existed in Beckhampton Avenue. 
Photographic evidence shows that the Silbury Stone Avenue went to the apex of Waden Hill beside the ploughed out barrows located to the eastern side of this new avenue. The most direct route from the peak would have been an south-southwest direction towards the base of Silbury Hill, but the gradient down this slope is large and would be an improbable route for laden carts. The best route for travellers would have been a longer, but with a far easier gradient to walk and carry goods, so not surprisingly, this path, which is still in existence today, and also used as a boundary marker between fields, can be found down the centre of the hill. We have found at sites like Old Sarum and the Avenue at Stonehenge, loading platforms placed on the ends of tracks and edges of the ditches, where boats used to dock and load. So, therefore, did Silbury Avenue have something similar? The answer was found on a LIDAR map of the area which showed a large mound at the end of the suspected avenue. In 2004, Pete Glastonbury, a photographer, rediscovered what he termed Silbaby Mound. This mound appears in early archaeological maps of Avebury but was lost through the introduction of the A4 on Ordnance Survey maps. After six years of campaigning and requesting an investigation, Soil samples were finally taken to date the mound, which had always been presumed to be a modern dumping ground from the A4's construction. So, the archaeologists thanked Pete for all his hard work, diligence and years of campaigning, but as he was not an archaeological professional, or a member of the elite academia club, they renamed his Silbaby. Waden Mount. Now that's what I call archaeological politics for you. Core samples were taken in 2010, and we await the official findings, but preliminary reports from Pete suggest it is human-made and has a similar composition and therefore date to Silbury Hill. Waden Mound, Silbaby, was built at the end of Silbury Stone Avenue for a reason. We know that it was surrounded by water as the Waden Spring is found even today at its base, and the external view of the mound is round like Silbury Hill from its height and size protruding into what would have been the raised water levels of the Kennet, it was more likely made specifically for the Silbury Stone Avenue, as a stable earth platform to load boats as seen at other sites like Old Sarum and Stonehenge. The waters around Silbury Hill eventually dried up as the groundwater receded even further over the next thousand or so years, therefore, a new mooring point was needed to maintain Avebury's trading status. At this time, there doesn't seem to be another typical harbour on the River Kennet available, so they created the final loading point on the river allowing traders to unload their ships and probably smaller boats, and this new loading quay is called the Sanctuary which was once the natural termination point of the Ridgeway Path, supposedly Britain's oldest pathway, which led to the Uffington White Horse. It's entirely possible that the use of the Sanctuary was a sign of Avebury's concluding days as a trading centre. As the mooring point was on the river, this would limit the number of boats that could moor daily. It is quite feasible that Silbury Hill Beacon could still have been used as a lighthouse, as shipping would need to pass the sanctuary before reaching Silbury Hill. Moreover, it's also possible that technology was by this time more advanced, and as we saw from the example of Spurn Point Lighthouse a new type of lighthouse structure was developed. If we look for a description of the sanctuary, we find it's both peculiar and familiar at the same time. It is a confusing site from an archaeological point of view. Despite a number of excavations, one as recent as 1999, it continues to be a challenge to researchers. It appears to have started as a series of small circles comprising of wooden posts, some of which have now been established as being quite massive. Whether these were evidence of a roofed building or just remained as standing posts is the subject of debate. Eventually, after many modifications, it was to evolve into a stone circle about 130 feet in diameter which has now disappeared. Whatever its purpose it remains an essential and fascinating part of the Avebury complex. Consequently, when Silbury Harbour dried up, this was the only logical landing site on the River Kennet near Avebury. So, they built a wooden lighthouse-like woodhenge with the same external diameter of 138 feet but with a smaller inner timber circle and posts just up to 24 inches wide, not 60 as at woodhenge, and hence probably half the size high. 
Moreover, Silbury Avenue was now redundant, and so they moved the large Avenue Sarsen stones from on top of the hill down to the east side and created West Kennet Avenue as we see today, with a zigzag kink and path correction as you enter Avebury. Let's recap what we have learnt in this chapter. 26. The Smoking Gun the excavation in 1914 by St. George Grey had to be halted as the groundwater had been reached and the ditch started to flood becoming a moat once more. This proves beyond all doubt that the higher river levels, as indicated in the BGS superficial deposit map, would have flooded the Avebury ditch with water. 27. The remarkable discovery of Silbury Avenue based on just a few crop marks and the post-glacial flooding hypothesis, proves that not only is the theory correct and rivers were much higher in the past than today, but moreover, this technique can be used to find and date the lost monuments of Britain.